Thank you, Evan. And uh, it's lovely to be here. And uh, the after lunch slot, I'm hoping that anybody who wants to have a little doze uh, in preparation for Dr. Helm's presentation after mine, you just go ahead and do that. <laughs> I'm kind of a nervous speaker, so uh, uh, be, be relaxing for me to see people falling asleep in the audience. <laughs> give you a little idea of what, uh, an overview of what we're going to be talking about. I'm going to give a working definition of compassionate love um, that I developed in the context, about 1998, in the context of doing a request for proposals for a private foundation. And I had to have a working definition to go on, so we're going to look at that. I'm going to discuss some qualitative interviews that I did with Christian Trappist uh, monks. Um, these would be monks in the Benedictine tradition on compassionate love and uh, we'll talk about what the definition of that is. Uh, I also talk about some other qualitative research around the issue of love. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about quantitative research on love. I thought maybe this would be something I could bring to this uh, discussion in an interesting way. Um, I developed a scale of 16 questions, and four of them deal specifically with love. And also to mention a model that I developed to help scientists interface with the world <laughs> and with others uh, around notions of doing research in this area. And unfortunately, when I timed my research, I'm going to run out of time for the arts. There's just not going to be time in the, in the, if I want to have time for discussion, which I really want to leave. So I'm going to whiffle a little bit through some visual art at the end. But that's about all I'm going to be able to do in that regard. So compassionate love. Um, it's other we're looking at other-centered love, self-giving love, agape, altruistic love, unconditional love. This isn't the same as, as compassion, but the, it was what I picked as the name to call it, um, this other-regarding, other-centered love, when I was trying to develop this request for proposals. My focus has been on the human experience of self-giving love. Love centered on the good of the other, with the motivation of supporting their flourishing, not only relieving suffering. The other group that, that wanted this name for compassionate love was the World Health Organization project that I brought together. Love was just too big a word and too mushy for some of the people from some traditions. And compassion was just too dry and desiccated for others. So we just kind of combined compassionate love, and it's just really a place marker for this uh, other regarding love that none of us can really describe fully. And I had to develop a working definition for this meeting in 99, and then a science research RFP. And these were the key qualities that I ended up coming up with for that. They're informed by theological uh, background, readings from the spiritual masters over time, um, philosophical, uh, looking at ethical research, and also the qualitative research that I did. So you'll see some overlap with the first, the first uh, presentation this morning in this, I think. It has to be some element of free choice, some degree of cognitive understanding of the situation, some understanding of yourself, fundamentally valuing the other, which is key to this definition, openness and receptivity. When I did this definition and this model, I had to do it for scientists, many of whom were not religious at all and uh, also from people from different faith traditions. So I wanted to have a space for grace in this model without pushing it on people that it had to be there. I personally think it has to be there, but I couldn't really lay that as in a science project. And then a response of the heart. And I don't mean aff affection or emotion here necessarily. I'm using heart as the core, uh, where emotions and cognitions integrate. And I've done some work on that in neuroscience, how we think of the core of the human being. So I'm going to move on to talk about these qualitative interviews that I did. Um, I interviewed Trappist Cistercian monks who are from the Benedictine tradition. They're contemplative monks. Uh, it was a, uh, I was doing it using qualitative methods. And we might want to talk about what are qualitative methods. They can be things like focus groups. Uh, they can be uh, um, observing people and then coding observations of what happens in the world. You can be like an anthropologist and go live with people. So those create qualitative research. 
I used something called a structured interview, and I just set questions. I tried very hard not to be overly responsive to the answer. I tried just to be a good listener. And then I would just write down everything I was hearing in the interviews, and then I would group it into things. So we're going to see some of these groupings. The monks that I used, I didn't pick them because I thought they were the most compassionate people in the world. I picked them because I thought they would have a better way of being reflective about this notion of compassionate love and the complexity involved in motivation and decision making. They spend time in this uh, contemplative tradition where they, um, seven times a day, they recite the Psalms, they read scripture together, uh, and even in the middle of the night, they spend a lot of time in, in contemplative prayer listening to God through things like Lexio Divina, where they read scripture and try to hear God speaking to them. And then they have an intention in their community to be, this is an important value for them. So that's why I picked them. The other thing was there was a book by Han De Witt called Contemplative Psychology. And it was really talking about how do we get good self-reports out of people? And there, as you know, probably from your friends, there are some of us that are more self-aware than others. And it was trying to kind of access the, the capacity for self-awareness in these monks. Also, I got a great group. Um, they were a real variety from age 34 to uh, 80. They were people who'd done business school. The one that introduced me to everybody had been a fighter pilot in World War II um, and uh, subsequent, had a great sense of humor. They were just a huge variety of different kinds of guys. And they were able to be open and honest in these interviews. And it was a blessing to me to be able to speak with them. So I'm going to talk about some of the things that came up in these interviews. Because it really, so first of all, I asked them a word that was good. And they thought agape was too, too much God's thing, agape. And as people, they weren't going to be able to do that. They thought compassionate love was OK, too, as a word. So what were some of the features they thought were important? Humility. Uh, if you look at that paper that I showed earlier, a lot of these things, you can find some of those in that paper. Humility, unselfishness, receptivity. This was one of my favorites. This was from the Abbot. Setting aside your agenda for the sake of, to strengthen, to give life to the other. I love that definition or kind of description of what compassionate love is. Experience, be present to the situation of the other. Respect. A mature view of reality. A certain degree of detachment. And one of the things I noticed, too, is the language they used, they weren't trotting out theological phrases, pat answers, which I found quite reassuring. You know, we all can trot out certain things, you know. Uh, and it's not always kind of in, in under our skin. Trust. Openness. Acceptance of self in order to accept others, which I think is a really marvelous insight. Really listening to the other. Denying self for something greater. Suffering with another. Helping another to become fully themselves. And being aware of my own emotions, acting rather than reacting. So these were some of the characteristics when they thought about compassionate love that were important to them. Now, I also asked them to reflect on the internal processes. What goes on when you have to make a decision? So they make lots of decisions. They run a bakery. They make fudge. They have a farm. They have the internal politics that any organization has. So giving of self for the good of the other could be things like letting another monk get the plum job. Uh, getting happy when another monk does a really uh, good job on something, even though you really don't like him. Um, they don't all like each other. You know, they have arguments. Um, letting a monk step in front of you in the food line. I mean, food's a big thing in the, in the Travis Monastery. <laughs> so it's things like that. And so when they were thinking about these kinds of things, what, what, what was going on inside? And there were kind of two major approaches. And I'm hearing this in the themes I'm hearing in various presentations um, this morning. Um, one is weighing of the individual actions, very analytic approach of weighing them. And the second was just this kind of attitude of heart. It just, I am, and then I do, and I'm loving, and it kind of just flows. So most had a combination, but they leaned in one direction or another. 
So when I ask them what goes on when we choose for the good of the other at, the co at cost to self, well, the cognitive weighing people, we're weighing various things. How much of myself is in this? How much of the other person? We can't ignore ourselves completely. What's the short-term benefit rather than long-term benefit? You can imagine you don't give. You might want to give a drink to somebody who's an alcoholic, but in the short term and make them happy. In the long term, it's not going to be so good for them. Close others and strangers. How do we do that balancing? There are people they're closer to in the monastery, and then there are guests, and then there are people they're not so close to. Giving and receiving. I thought that was an important one. We often think compassionate love, uh, other regarding love. It's all about giving, but if we don't provide a space to receive love from God, from other people, then we're not uh, going to be able to uh, really uh, allow them to give. There's somebody, they're passing around a handout. It's not really relevant. It's more for afterwards, so you can look at references, and you'll have the references on it. It doesn't follow and map onto this. Um, and then the final one is balancing justice and mercy. Um, Dr. Waltersdorf has written some great stuff on this, uh, love and mercy, how do we, how, you know, love and, and justice, how do we balance these things? And that's something they have to think about in the monastery all the time. And then the second thing that what goes on inside is this kind of attitude of heart. And there's always the challenge of self-report when you do interviews, but they seem to be very honest. I, they, I was not going to be quoting them to anybody. I, wasn't, they, I was outside of their political system. <laughs> they didn't have to look good in my eyes, and so I, got, I think I got very honest reports from people. Now, some, what were some of the processes for sifting motivations? We heard earlier how important motivation is for compassionate love, other regarding love, and I think it's key. And so what were some of the pro things that they mentioned when they were... Uh, weighing individual actions. I ask how much of me is in this. I quiet down, I get myself out of the way. Sometimes there's a natural pull. I'm more attracted to one person than another. It's a lot easier to do nice things for people who I like. I let go of a grasping feeling inside. When I have a contented feeling, it's a signal of kind of a deep inner freedom uh, that signifies that I I'm just kind of going with God's flow of love. I make sure that what others would say is not driving my actions. Ultra conscientiousness can be a danger. Uh, kind of, you try to do good, I'm, I'm really great. Higher moral ground, you can imagine in a monastery, that's, that's a real value. And so they're continually trying to uh, kind of guard against just doing something because it gives them a higher moral ground. And then we talked about weighing values earlier. And then they mentioned self-interest is a value, but it's to, to be placed at a lower level than the value of others. And then to do good because it's good. One monk mentioned correcting for weakness by doing good things unseen, rather than just to look good. And then looking at that other process, remember that internal lens of just kind of being, <laughs> being love and expressing it naturally. We have just the attitude of valuing the other somehow brings lo uh, compassionate love flows out of us when we value the other. They mentioned a feeling of willingness, which I kind of think about having God's will and our will kind of just naturally lined up <laughs> so that the sort of willingness just happens. And then just not being aware. Some of them were just not aware of how this was working in them. Now, this is an interesting one, too. I asked the question, what attitudes get in the way when you're trying to be self-giving, express self-giving love to others? A need for reciprocal love and affection often can drive our love. And that isn't fully the kind of love we're hoping for. Need to be accepted and to belong a desire to avoid confrontation. A lot of us, sometimes we think we're being really nice to somebody because we're being nice, but sometimes it's just because we don't want the confrontation, and confrontation may be the more loving thing. Seeing the other as an extension or reflection of myself. And I think a lot of social scientists who are looking at other regarding love often uh, stumble into this, and I think that is not fully self-giving love. Pleasure in looking well in the eyes of others. And control of others through their indebtedness. You know, I'm doing for you, I'm doing, I'm doing, and I'm, I'm, I'm on top here in the score chart. 
and a desire to exercise power over others and feel superior. So these are things they recognize as something that got in the way of God's love flowing through them into others in their community. Now, all motives are a mixture. I look at that list and I mean, if we say so much of our motives are mixed and we just are human beings after all, but how can we encourage these other-centered motives and be aware of the motives that detract? So what are some of the practices they use that help them? Strengthening my identity, awareness of who I am, was one of them said. So somehow when their own identity is stronger, they can then be more, more loving towards others, rather than dependent on their identity being continually reinforced by the surroundings. Quiet and time alone. Living in a community that supports the value of love an unselfish lifestyle, a balanced life, respect for myself, respect for others, prayer, spiritual reading, critique of aware community, so the community keeps you right. If you're trying to be a do-gooder, they'll say, you're just, do, you're just being a do-gooder, you know, and it keeps them kind of on, on, I don't know, correct inside, keeps me straight, one of the guys said. Listening, very underestimated to quality. Doing compassionate things encourages us to do more. The whole idea of it reinforcing our character, our growth. Learning about people, avoiding aggression and violence, and cultivating awareness of motives. Okay, so that's the qualitative, that's sort of some of the qualitative stuff. And hopefully I'm not too far behind. Okay, and this is the quantitative research, and I won't be able to really, you know, just kind of touch the uh, tip of the iceberg on this. Quantitative research is necessary. It, in, in the sciences, you have to put numbers on things. They don't let you put in studies unless you add a number to something. So I have been stuck a lot of my life doing quantitative research, and I don't really love it, but it's a necessary evil in the world. Um, <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about a few things here. I'm going to skip through this. This is, I think, a good, this is a Magritte painting, and when we do quantitative research, we're trying to capture the, the scene out the window. That's what we want to get in our research. But so often, we don't do as good a job as this person did of doing the painting. We often have a Mondrian sitting in front of this, this view out the window, and we don't capture it very well. I developed a scale, this Daily Spiritual Experience Scale, the DSES, and I did it using qualitative research. I interviewed young people, old people, uh, people who were from the inner city, um, uh, very diverse ethnic groups, different religions in this World Health Organization project, to find out what were some good questions that asked about ordinary spiritual experiences. And it was designed to transcend religious boundaries, but still address theistic experience within particular religious contexts. So I tried to do everything with this scale. I was supposed to go on you know, studies, and I wanted it to be used uh, widely. So it, it measures the perception of ordinary interactions with God in daily life. That's what it's aimed to do. It's been translated into 40 languages. And it's been used in over 300 published studies, as, many, as, as well as many de-minced theses. So it's being used a lot. And because it kind of gets at the deep religious, but also gets at the uh, less so, it kind of appeals to a lot of people. And it predicts lots of stuff, but I'm not going to go into that. These are the, the, I think these are on your handout. So... What, is, what are these questions? I want to talk about the questions a little bit because it's how do you do quantitative research? And it asks how many times a day, many times a day to never do you experience these things? And it has an introductory sentence that says, any answer you say is just fine and dandy. And it also says, if the word God is uncomfortable for you, use a God that it was a word that indicates the divine or holy for you. And this has been important in it being able to be used more widely than in just a Christian setting. These are the kind of questions, and I'm not going to spend so much. Uh, four of them are in love, so I'm just going to skibble through this first set here. Spiritually touched by the beauty of creation. Uh, I developed these with a kind of a fundamental, really, a, uh, I will say to you in this group, a Christian <laughs> theological start. But I then tried to be encompassing of a variety of different kinds of people. I am spiritually touched by the beauty of creation. Uh, I feel thankful for my blessings. I ask for God's help in the midst of daily activities. 
I feel guided by God in the midst of daily activities. I feel deep inner peace or harmony. I feel, find strength in my religion or spirituality, comfort in my religion or spirituality. And so this is many times a day to never. I desire to be closer to God or in union with the divine. I feel God's presence. I experience a connection to all of life. And then here are the love questions. Oh no, one more here. During worship or at other times when connecting with God, I feel intense joy, which lifts me out of my daily concerns. So that's as a more um, community uh, and, and orientation. And then the love questions are, I feel God's love for me directly. I feel God's love for me through others. And these have been very powerful uh, questions in predicting many different things. The whole set predict tons of things, but those two questions also predict independently. And I was able to do interviews to make sure, what does this mean to you? I asked lots of people in structured interviews, what does this mean to you? And was able to confirm that they were getting at what I was wanting it to get at. I feel a selfless caring for others. These are the love out questions. And this question, when I did it in the interviews, even though it has selfless in it, People didn't interpret that as that I couldn't care about myself at all. It was just that self was not the center of the caring, because it's the adjective. I accept others even when they do things I think are wrong. So that's the mercy question. So uh, the, these have been put on a number of studies. Um, one, an example of a project that those are on at the moment is a, har a project with Harvard University that's looking at prospective studies of health and uh, Stephen mentioned epigenetic change. It's looking at why do we have such health disparities in the country? Why are certain ethnic groups really dying <laughs> more and have, have higher hypertension and uh, dying of, of various cancers more frequently than the typical white population? So it's following longitudinal studies of Hispanics, African Americans, Native Americans, um, South Asian people, and they have blood and DNA and all that sort of stuff. And so this, these questions are being put on these longitudinal studies, and that means those numbers that are there can be correlated with things in the future. So if you wanted to look at love, these love questions, love in and love out, you could look at that in that data set and see does it connect with anything that you're interested in in this population. Staying on time here. This is an example. What do you do with those numbers? So it was put on the General Social Survey, which is a survey in 2002. It was random population data, you know, full distribution of everybody, uh, races, uh, ages, ethnic groups, um, religions. And this was the kind of percentages that came out, which is kind of interesting. When I did this scale, I really didn't know, you know, what. What, how often are people going to have these things? That was something I didn't know at all. And I was quite pleased that there were people were reporting, you know, feeling selfless, caring for others, you know, 10% many times a day. I thought, oh, that's kind of nice. And look around myself, maybe there's some of that going on. <laughs> but I also was reassured that there were a bunch of people saying never, in a way, because it meant my scale worked. It meant people were, you know, you ask a question of people, are you nice? Well, almost everybody says they're nice, you know? So you have to ask a question in a way that they feel okay saying no. And so they felt okay saying no, never for this. And so the nice distribution is reassuring for me, for the numbers. And then if you look at the accept other ones, you see the distribution in the population. So even though these are crude, I admit they're crude, that qualitative research is just so rich and deep, but it does give us something, and it can allow us to uh, lift up a certain element of the human person that doesn't sometimes get, get uh, viewed. So quantitative research can inform our understanding of love, but choice of the questions is very important. You just can't pick some question out of the, out of the air. And then a model can help us to fit various results together and help us to effectively apply it to our lives. So when I developed that definition back in 98, 99 for the meeting and then for the request for proposals from the scientists, um, which we ended up drawing people in around a topic, I developed a model so that people would be able, the scientists would be able to fit their pieces together into the picture of what would cause love and what would, how would love work. So again, it's crude. Uh, you ethicists are going to not find this adequate, but it, it is a crude model that allows people to interact. 
uh, around different things. So the substrate is we all start as different people. Some of us are more naturally empathetic than others, for example. Um, we have different ca uh, physical capacities. Um, the social, environmental, cultural, you could add religious there. The environments we grow up in shape how we love others and what we have capacity for. Situational factors. Uh, if you're there with your, your, uh, your dad or your mom or your kids, you're going to act differently in terms of a loving situation than if you're with strangers. Um, and then I have in the center of this model motivation and discernment, which very often was left out because it's so hard to measure. And when we were looking at the monastic study with the qualitative stuff, you saw that, that you could really get at that to some extent. But it's very difficult to do in research settings. Uh, there are a variety of ways we can do it. I don't have time to go into those, but you can get at it some. And then I have compassionate love fully expressed. If your motivation and discernment are on target, then you go, uh, compassionate love is fully expressed. But you can have negative motivation and discernment. You could be doing something, you could give money to a college because you only want to see your name on the, on the building. And that's maybe not, it's kind of positive behavior, but it's not really compassionate love fully expressed. So it, uh, the, one of the things that I built into this model was a kind of a feedback loop. When we do good with these good motives, it can reinforce that and strengthen that in us. If we do it for not so good motives, it can really even get in our way, ultimately, in terms of our perceptions of ourselves. On the other hand, if we are, become aware of that, we might just call ourselves to account and, and it could have a positive effect on us. I think one of the things that this model can help is when you read about studies have shown about anything that has to do with altruism, love, <laughs> social relationships, you know, you can kind of see, well, where would it fit in here? It can help you a little bit think about what are the practical implications of that research. If somebody looks at a, a brain scan and they say, we have a brain scan and we have increased oxytocin and then we have these actions. Well, you can say, well, is there anything being left out? You know, is there, what does this have to say about compassionate love, if that's what you're interested in. One way that this is being used, for example, using that daily spiritual experience scale I was mentioning, I don't want to go too much, I'm getting, uh, wrapping this uh, quantitative stuff up, is that it's been shown the daily spiritual experience scale predicts less burnout in all sorts of people. It, so higher scores on that daily spiritual experience scale, which has the love questions, but also those other ones, people who are trying to care for others in nurses, uh, social workers, um, uh, parents of disabled kids, um, ministers. The DSES predicts less burnout in, in a group of Protestant ministers in, in Germany. They were less burnt out if they scored higher on the DSES. So it predicts a less burnout. And one of the thoughts is you're getting... Um, sort of support from the divine. You're getting grace that's fueling your love that is less exhausting to you than if you're just trying to, you know, grit your teeth and trying to do it and without that sort of receptivity uh, to God's love flowing through you and into your work. Let's see. I'm going to, I think... I was trying to decide. Uh, I have this one more comment would be a study. It's also being used in a study of stress in a smartphone study, which is kind of interesting. It's, it's 2,000 people, smartphone, the DSES, those 16 questions are administered twice a day. They also measure things like stressors. So how stressed are you and what relationships are you in? And then they also ask a question, how loving and caring are you feeling at the moment? And they find that people who are under high stress are less loving. They're less feeling loving and caring. You can imagine when you're in a traffic jam, you probably don't feel terribly loving and caring toward those in front of you. However, when the people are, um, have higher DSES than their normal, they're still able to feel loving and caring even in the midst of the stressful situation. So it's kind of interesting. That's the kind of thing that this can lead to. Now, I don't have time to do the arts, which is such a shame, but I want time for questions, and I 
probably, I thought this was the better thing for me to present on. But I think arts really, you know, we talk about qualitative research enriching our understanding. I think the arts just really uh, over the top do that. They really can um, do that beautifully. And I particularly like poetry, but I think film and television have a real rich uh, mine of different situations you can be exposed to uh, that would be good. Fiction of various kinds. I'm sure you have all your favorites, and I'm not going to list mine. <laughs> and visual art. Um, so I'm going to skip over uh, this, which is, let's see. Yeah, I'm going to skip over this. This is a film. But I wanted to show some visual images at the end, since it's after lunch. I have some pictures here. So this is a, an image of, by Guernso, Guernsino. Um, and one of the things I like about it is here Christ is being compassionately loving. First of all, merciful toward the woman. Second of all, standing, the Pharisee there is just ready to accuse her. And, the, and Christ is just, you know, you can see holding the finger back there down at the bottom. Um, standing, standing firm. It's not a lovey-dovey Christ necessarily. So I think this really speaks to me of compassionate love. This is by Tim Lowley, who's done some beautiful, beautiful images of his disabled daughter and his wife. And they're worth, worth looking at all his work and just the, the sort of respect and care he has for her. Icons, I think, can, in a transcendent way, be visual art that can uh, really uh, stir love in us. This is uh, Our Lady of Vladimir, a very famous icon. And then this icon, which is the Trinity icon by Ruvlev, I think also we think about compassionate love within the Trinity itself. Um, I think for me, I find that rather inspiring. Also, photography uh, can capture things in a way. Uh, one of the studies that we supported under that request for proposals was looking at people in war and what do people in war do to be compassionately loving. And one of them is not doing anything. One of the things that they reported in this Red Cross study was to actually not do what you were supposed to do in a variety of war situations was one of the thing, ways they felt they expressed compassionate love to others. And then, of course, this picture is quite lovely in itself. And then I want to make some last comment about the importance of receiving in compassionate love. Uh, it's really important to think about how do we receive from God and from others and also to celebrate joy. Compassionate love, although it has that word compassion, it's about the flourishing of the other person. How, and how, when somebody else is joyful, can we join in with their joy, and is that, can that be loving? I picked this cover art for the Altruism and Altruistic Love book, and it's a giant sculpture with mica chips. And uh, a woman took, Jay DeFeo took eight years to construct it, and to me it's love in the rough and the smooth of life, uh, beauty and, and difficulty. And that's it. Um, so thank you very much. Uh.